Anna, so a little disclaimer here. I've worked with Hewlett Foundation for 25 years and with Anna for 20 of those 25 years through nine managers. We've seen everything together. Yes. Um, Anna has 18 years of direct investing experience and 18 years of um, working for the Hewlett Foundation, investing in managers. She has written a book 36 years later. And I think of this book um, as the, the Venn diagram middle between margin of safety for Seth Klarman and David Swenson's portfolio theory. Um, but let's forget all of that, Anna. I've got the first question I want to ask you is, why do you hate being called an allocator? Because I, I, like, it makes me cringe every time they call LPs allocators. Um, I would say the reason is allocators makes it seem like we're not responsible for the underlying investments. And the reality is we own every single investment in the portfolio. So you have to think of yourself as an investor first, not an allocator. And I think bringing that mentality of being an investor and really digging and making sure you would want to put this in your portfolio is part of our responsibility. So what should we call you? Investors. Investor, okay. All of you remember that, okay? So, Anna, let's talk about your book, um, The Climb to Excellence. This mountain, can you tell us what this mountain represents? Is so, it you? Is it Hewlett? Is it your life? <laughs> Uh, it's Hewlett. Uh, it's the Hewlett objective. And part of the reason it's um, the whole entire book is really a metaphor is, is climbing a highly technical mountain. And the mountain is whatever it is your investment committee or your family office, whatever your investment objective is, that is your mountain you are climbing. And it means you have to have different techniques, different equipment, different team to climb different mountains. And it all is about what are the skills needed to get to the top of that mountain. And that's decided by the investment committee and the board or in a family office, the founder. But let's go back to base camp. 20 years ago, you arrived at the Hewlett Foundation. The tool set that you had when you worked for RCM, which of those tools did you take into Hewlett with you? And what, let's start with that. Let's. So I would say the, the, the tool that they hired me for was my ability to uh, pick stocks and portfolio construction. So part of the reason why I had been a very successful investor was portfolio construction. I was able to generate alpha consistently year after year. In the 18 years I ran money, I only had one year where I didn't generate alpha. Wow. And a lot of that was due to portfolio construction. And that was the skill that they wanted. Um, I arrived at the Hewlett Foundation and they had just sold down all of their donor stock. And so my job was really to think about portfolio construction and they already had great governance. So I joined having asked the one question that if you ever wanna to switch to this side, you would wanna say, and that is, what is your governance structure? Um, I'm a big fan of that because it allows you to build the team that you really need to have um, when you get more discretion as a CIO and it just makes everything flow better. So Laurie Hoagland, legend, late Laurie Hoagland, who was the first CIO of Stanford University, was Anna's CIO when she joined the Hewlett Foundation. What, what did Laurie teach you at the beginning that you still continue to use today? So Laurie taught me the art of listening. Uh, Laurie was a person of few words, but he listened intently. And I think many times we go meet with managers or we sit in committee meetings with our investment committee or our board and we don't really listen. We're so prepared with either our next question if it's with our managers or with our rebuttal and defense if we're talking to our boards and our investment committees. And I don't think we spend the time to really listen to what is underneath that question. What is it they're concerned about that they're asking us? And I find that that's one of the best ways to really sort of solidify your relationship with your IC. So you started at Hewlett, you started building that portfolio. And I will tell you all, one of the first decisions Anna made was to fire the manager that I worked with, but we're still friends 20 years later. She went to Laurie and said, um, can I fire this manager? And she fired her. So that's how we met, actually, the first time. So, you know, it shows that relationships do matter. But how did you start building the team and realize that you needed to skill the team to climb this mountain? 
So just having a skilled team is not enough. Um, you need a team that actually works at the same pace. Um, a team that at least in pairs. So I, I run a very concentrated portfolio and I run a very small team. And part of the reason is every single member of the team does their own work. Yes, we, we have like one layer of analysts down, but the reality is I'm in every meeting, we're digging in, it's a very active portfolio. And what you want really is people who are adaptable, who are skilled, that goes without saying, but who are able to have different skills among themselves. I have one who is an extraordinarily good per people person. I have one who's very good in quant. Um, one who just treasures relationships and is able to see sort of that magic in you know, one of their junior people. Everybody has a different skill, but my job is to bring out their superpower over the course of the time they work for me. So you're talking about assets under management and your team. Can you just tell everyone how much you manage and how the size of your team? So we run $13 billion. Um, the size of my team, I call them nine. Most of you would call five, four of them uh, non-investment people. So we basically are six investment people, including myself, five, five now, investment people, including myself, and we manage all our relationships. So six people, $13 billion, and you've been top five over one, three, five, seven, 10, and 15 years. I'm sure all of you are asking the question, how the hell do you do it with six people? Can you, can you elaborate? Um, so first, we run hard. I mean, people that come on our team need to understand we run hard. Not everybody makes it on our team, quite honestly. Um, the reason I liken it to a team, to a team that climbs highly technical mountains is the moment you realize that somebody on your team is not running at your speed, you have to slow down and help them go to a different mountain. Th there are many teams, there are many family offices, endowments, foundations, places where they can work and they can thrive. But if you're not running at our pace, you will have a miserable existence because you will feel like, it's like if you're not a runner and you run with a really good runner and you feel like you're being pulled along, it's miserable. You have to have somebody on your team that just loves, you run. And so it's 24 seven, it's a job that you do with passion. And unless I see that passion in people, they just don't last on the team. But if you're climbing this mountain, you're, you're the leader, right? You're taking this team with you. Is there a point at which you might make a misstep and one of the guys might holler out to you, Anna, Anna, hold on, we need to go left, not right. And if they do, do you listen? There's many times that okay. happens. That is the magic of having a team you trust. And trust is a very big part of climbing a mountain and is a very big part of having a team. Um, I trust that they have the best interest at heart and if what I'm saying is not exactly what they think we should be doing, they're quite vocal. They have no problem stopping me in my tracks saying, what are you thinking? So you thinking about going this direction, what is it that you really want to achieve? Like, let's stop, let's think about it, let's question it. Um, yeah, they do it to me just like I do it to them. And like, you listen it's fair to them? Game, of course. They're excellent investors. How long does it take you to build up that trust? Um, I would say probably about four years till I start trusting them. And then the more they're open to adapting, which is a big part of what I look for in people, which is both in my team and in the managers we have in the portfolio, is their ability to adapt. And if they adapt and they listen and they learn, then that's, that's what I'm looking for. What would you say is your team's motto? If you had to stitch something onto your backpack while you're climbing, what would that so motto be? So we actually be? have, we, we don't have a team motto. We have like the three things. Okay. The first one is excellence. Do everything with excellence. If you're gonna come to work and you're not gonna be excellent today, like, it's, we're gonna notice because we're really close. So excellence is one of them. Integrity is the other one. We have a great deal of responsibility managing money for the foundation. We give away 650 million to 700 million dollars away a year to charitable uh, organizations. There are a lot of people that count on us to do our jobs and to do them well. 
And so integrity, and then the third one is passion. You have to be intellectually curious. You have to love what you do. You have to love getting emails from me at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. You have to love getting on an airplane, because I am always on airplanes, and going and finding new things and new countries and new or organizations and just that joy. What's the, what's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself in this, this climb of the Hewlett Mountain? Control your fear and your anxiety. I think too many of us live in fear of getting things wrong, and it's true, but the job of a good CIO is to take enough risks to where you get some things wrong, but to size it in a way that you can continue to climb the mountain if it goes wrong. And I think the calibration of being able to construct a portfolio to size it so it matters, but if it goes wrong or sideways, your team lives to fight another day. And as a CIO, I own every single investment in the portfolio. Every, they have my back and they know it. So one of the things that I love about this book, because for the last five years, I've been complaining that everyone's given up on public markets. And I know you as passionate about public markets, an excellent investor, you know the stocks, you know the thing. And what I love about this book, you really lay out that you cannot build a great portfolio without having exposed to public markets. But still today, I speak to investors, they're all annoyed about privates and venture, but they keep doing it, and they keep doing that expense of their public exposure. Can you sort of elaborate on your passion for public markets, why it's so important, and what you'd say to people that are drunk on venture and privates? Okay, so I don't, I wouldn't claim people are drunk on venture and buyout, but. I'm not saying, I'm, but these are my words, not yours. Um, I would say the reason why you want public markets, and I know it's very cool to do privates and it's so much sexier, believe me. But public markets provide flexibility. And the reality is not only does the world change, the organizations for whom we run money change. And if you tie yourself too much in private markets, you aren't able to flex and you're not able to actually change the objective. And sometimes institutions are very fortunate, they receive transformative gifts and that changes the entirety of how the portfolio needs to be constructed. And sometimes it's exactly the other, the other way. The organization wants to spend more money. And if you have to all of a sudden increase your spending rate to set seven or 10%, and you already put this portfolio on a path to have 50% privates, you have no flexibility. And so I think people want, just look at the, at the expected return and the somewhat pretend volatility of privates and say, okay, let's put them in. But what any type of optimization model doesn't capture is the liquidity profile and the liquidity profile of the actual client, which is the organization that needs the money. And your number one job as a CIO is not to generate, it is to generate excellent returns. The number one job is to have enough money when the C CFO calls you and says, we need this much money tomorrow or we need this much money over this course of the next two years because we have this great project. And I think too many people don't add that dimension of flexibility, and I just, that's why we always will have an allocation to publics. Can you elaborate how much you have in public markets today in your portfolio? So we're about half publics, half privates, and part of the reason is um, we also have fixed income, which I know a lot of endowment and foundations don't have, we have it as an accordion, and we believe it's an accordion asset class. When, and the accordion grows when absolute return on fixed income grows, and then it goes to zero, which was most of the last sort of three years of my life, was at zero. And then we just grew our fixed income um, now that fixed income and credit can earn a decent absolute return. It just seems sort of insane to not anchor your portfolio when you, all of us are, well, many of us are expected to have payouts sort of somewhere between five and 7% to sort of say, hey, at 5%, I can secure part of my payout already by putting it in fixed income or seven or eight or 10, whatever flavor of fixed income you want. Um, it just makes more sense. So can you elaborate, when you joined the Hewlett and they just sort of um, sold down the stock, 
Can you talk about the build out of the private portfolio? Because you know, I think a lot of people are interested in that and how that happened. Did you do privates first, venture first, kind of how you thought about the whole landscape? So we were fortunate. We're on Sand Hill Road. And we had always had a, even though we had the venture, the, the donor stock, we always had a nascent uh, venture portfolio. It was about 6% of the assets. Um, so it wasn't major, but it was good enough to be able to have caught sort of the 2000 wave. Um, by the time I joined, uh, venture was about 5% of the portfolio. Um, our private portfolio in general was about 15% of the portfolio, and I was responsible for all publics. And over time, we grew that portfolio. Again, though, we decided that we would do it in a very concentrated fashion. So we have 10 buyout managers, 10 venture managers, six real estate managers. Um, I mean, we really tried to be quite methodical about it. What's the hardest asset class to find talent in? To find talent on our side or to find talent on the manager side? Your side, that you, you, you have to invest in. Hedge funds. And to find a hedge fund. So hedge funds are whatever anyone wants to make of it, I would say. <laughs> so one of the things that you'll find in the book is um, people get very disappointed with hedge funds. And I might be the only defender of hedge funds on this planet, but part of the reason is too often the hedge funds have, if they have 100 clients, they have probably 30, 30 of those clients are expecting different things out of their hedge fund. And it's quite frustrating for the hedge fund managers, I think. When you hire a hedge fund into your portfolio, you should know exactly what you're looking for, what it is. I would say this for any manager. What do you expect from this hedge fund? What is it supposed to add to your portfolio? And you can find some really talented hedge fund managers. You can find what's harder is to find somebody on our side that has experience with hedge funds, can speak hedge fund language, and is able to call bullshit because that is what we are hired to do. And so if they haven't been sitting at a hedge fund, they don't know, they'll, they might listen to something that the, that the manager, the GP says, and actually believe it, whereas if you've been inside of the hedge fund, you know it's complete BS. And so I tend to hire people that have been inside of hedge funds, inside of public equity funds, inside of private equity funds, because I think they just have a better radar. I think your team's excellent doing that. So I've been on the other side of you calling bullshit a lot of times. So can you elaborate on the things that you call bullshit on um, today, particularly um, in the markets and trends, things that people are doing that you think, why are you doing that? Sort of things that really um, rally up the see. wrong way. I particularly like the everyone's doing it. That's my favorite one um, that I call bullshit on. Um, I would say we sometimes, I mean, sometimes the performance numbers are actually calculated wrong on, in, so please check people's numbers. Uh, a lot of times they are not AIMR compliant, like they take stuff out and deals out. So ask the questions, have you taken deals out? They won't lie in your face, but You'd be amazed how many people take deals out of performance calculations, guys. Um, hopefully, no GP here does that, and you guys are all cool, but um, it does happen. We also call it on just uh, margin expansion was one of my favorites when I'm listening to managers of like, well, we go in, we have this toolkit, and we expand margins by X, and you're just like, do you know how hard it is to expand margin by 300 basis points? Have you ever actually operated? A, like, that's hard. Um, and so we call, call it on that. Um, and then on team, on team dynamics. We spend a lot of time on team dynamics. We track a lot of the associates, principals in private firms. We track them all throughout their careers um, in our database. And we know if people are coming back after business school. We know if I get a lot of them in my class at Stanford. And so they're the ones populating the, the, um, the data rooms. They're the ones creating the slides. 
it's amazing what happens if you spend time with the associates and principals at cocktail parties. You find out a heck of a lot about firms that you otherwise would not find out. So that leads really nicely into my next question. The one thing that I've always admired about you is that you are the first investor that any manager calls when they've got an issue, a concern, something they're struggling with. Why do they do that? What have you done in your life or in your relationships to be that person that all these managers call? That's a real superpower. Um, I think they, I mean, I listen and I, what, I, what I want is what's best for their firm. So my job is to be the best partner I can be and just listen to them if they're thinking about, you know, taking out three partners. Uh, how would the LPs react? If they're thinking of slightly modifying the, the objective that they're trying to follow, how would the LPs react? Just helping them think through a lot of the strategic questions about their firms and what direction they want to take them. It's fascinating to me, and I also don't ever talk about one firm to any other firm. I, everything is in a cone of silence in each one, and over the course of years, they know that that's who I am. I, I keep their secrets, and I try to just be objective. One thing I've also seen you do, which is incredible, um, you'll look at a manager, and you'll break out how they've generate, generated returns and say, this stuff isn't good, this stuff's good. Yes. How do you get people to do customized solutions for you? Because you've done this for 20 years now, your portfolio is quite mature, so you really know what you need around the edges. How do you get, and I know, gigantic managers to do customized solutions for you? Because that is a big thing that I know a lot of guys in this room would love to have as well. I try to make them see that if they create a product for me and they can generate a good track record, it'll be a product that a lot of people will take up and therefore use me as the beta test. Let's see how it goes. I'll give you constant feedback on this and then let's see, and then you could probably market this to a whole lot of people and it'll be, and so that's how I've convinced them. Do you, th you think working for a mission-based organization helps managers think about you in a much more positive light than it I does? used to think that. You don't now? I don't anymore Why? because I think there's a lot of people I'm competing for allocations with a lot of really great organizations. And so it used to be a differentiated source. I could say, oh, we're Hewlett, oh, we're so special. Um, no, I mean, uh, there's a lot of endowments that are doing great things with their scholarship programs. There's a lot of hospital systems that are doing great things to cure people. I can't say, oh, our, our causes are better than someone else's. That would be rude. Um, and so I used to think that was a, a competitive thing. I think at this point, it's the partnership and the reputation Hewlett has for long-term partnerships on both the philanthropic side as well as the investment side were known as being relationship-centric. And I think that does it. So, apart from this book, which other book would you recommend <laughs> the audience reads? Um, well, I'm sure everybody's all read Dave Swanson's book, so I don't think that would be uh, another one. Um, this is actually, just as a caveat, you can read it cover to cover, but that's actually not only the reason I wrote it. I spend a lot of time on the glossary and the index so that it's a reference guide. You get asked about benchmarks, either because you're a GP and somebody's asking you about constructing their benchmark, or you're an LP. Six pages will tell you what you need to know. So I would say. I put you on the spot there. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. I read so much. Yeah. <coughs> I would say Ted's book. OK. On having conversations and interviewing managers. Because if you're a GP, you have to know how to interview well. And if you're an LP, he, does, he actually lowers the threshold for um, doubting yourself, especially for younger members of your team. Ted sort of starts with questions that are easy for people to step into. And I think younger members of teams do have a, um, a reluctance to ask that piercing question, and Ted teaches you how to ask that question in a less harsh way. 
What's, what's the one question that you ask every manager? Um, every with? single manager I ask, why are you doing this? I mean, what drives the manager? The, di the real difference between being a GP and being an LP is as an LP, you have to believe not only in the opportunity set and in the, you have to judge the GP's ability to execute on a strategy. And then third, you have to, you have, to have the probability that the GP's personality, motivation, integrity, everything about them will keep them on the path that you set. And that is a social sort of psychological event to our business that isn't as important when you're picking stocks and you have a board of directors and a CEO. Yes, the CEO can take the strategy anywhere it wants, but at the end of the day, there's like a whole organization. In most of the GPs we invest in, it's that GP that really drives the culture of the firm. And so you have to be really sure that that GP is driven to have returns and have returns for their clients, not returns in their pocketbook, be the reason they're getting up in the morning and doing their job. You've got one minute left. And you said you had a question for me so as you, our last question. So Raul sees everyone. Raul knows everyone. What is it that you think I do? Because I don't think what I do is that different. But it is. But why? I don't. You're not a trend follower. You do no. what you want to do. I learned two things from you, which were correlations. I remember asking Anna, why do you need to know what stocks we have in our portfolio? Stupid question, of course. And she said to me, well, you've got to understand I have all these managers. They say all holding the same stocks. I'm not doing anything that's clever. So obviously you need to have, and then port, your obsession with portfolio construction. Yeah. I, I just have never met anyone who's so obsessed with portfolio construction and it's paid off in heaps for you. So yes. um, your team are just like no other team I've ever met. I mean, they're all frigging rock stars. It's an honor and a pleasure to work with all of you. So thank you guys. Thank you. Please thank Anna and please buy this book. <laughs>